So, Johnny, most people spend their university summers maybe having a little bit too much to drink. They might go into railing or something like that. But that wasn't your story. What did you get up to in your summers? So I had this burning desire since I was a small child to work with wildlife. And I spent my university summers, bearing in mind I was studying medieval history and archaeology. I went really wild, really wild in the summers. And I spent all my time volunteering and working in these very interesting animal collections, animal sanctuaries, and we're not talking dogs and cats and rabbits. We're talking rhinos, emus, tigers, wolves, 20 cat species, the, the full works. So I had some pretty interesting experiences. Some, looking back now, some fairly risky experiences. There was not much health and safety in a lot of these places, but I was <laughs> 19, 20, I didn't care. I was having the time of my life and it was, Fantastic. I learned a lot about wildlife. I learned a lot about people. Some of the people running these places are characters, I think. We'll call them characters. So it was, yeah, a great way to spend two summers. Yeah, I bet, man. And I, I don't want to label everyone with the Tiger King label, but I think over COVID, everyone had their eyes open to, ah, oh, like the, the, the big animal, wild animal world can attract a certain type of personality and uh, sometimes can be as wild as the animals themselves. So you, I didn't know you were studying medieval history and everything like that. That's that's crazy. How did you pivot into doing a PhD in snow leopard conservation then? Because that doesn't seem like a natural career progression. Yeah, I, I, you could say I'm a jack of all trades. And my other big thing that I loved apart from wildlife and especially big cats was history. I just loved history. And I went to Queens to do it. Fell in love with the medieval history and the medieval period particularly. And then at postgrad, started to transition to sustainability and environmental issues. So I went to business school at Queens and did business management and sustainability. But I thought my background in the humanities and social sciences would hold me back when it came to work in conservation. But actually, conservation is a social process. If we want to save nature, including snow leopards or Loch Ness, we've got to understand human nature. And so coming to conserve snow leopards or other species with understanding human history and human behavior has actually served me really well. And conservation is is trying to get more and more skills like that because natural science alone doesn't have all the answers, whether it's nature, climate, we need to understand people because we're, we're part of the problem, but we're also part of the solution. Sure. Why snow leopards in particular? It's not just the species, it, it's the home. I am a lover of the mountains and they are the king of the mountains of and the Himalayas are, are the, the king of the king of all mountains. It's so it's the place, it's it's the people, it's the the cultures. When I was my final university summer, I went to the Himalaya and I walked and trekked in Nepal and then I climbed in India with some friends and I, I just fell in love with it. So to be able to bring a passion for that part of the world and my passion for big cats and I focused on rural development and how you solve the thorny conundrum of livestock farmers whose livestock are eaten by snow leopards and how you work with them to, to, to fix that problem. So bringing in the social dimension, the agricultural dimension, it just brought all of those together into a subject that I absolutely love and, and continue to dabble in and be very passionate about. This episode is part of our ongoing series with NI Connections, where we interview an interesting person from Northern Ireland who's living and slash or working overseas. Now, who are NI Connections? They are the diaspora department of Invest in I, and their mission is really, really simple. It's to connect the Northern Irish community all around the world. They put together some really incredible resources, including how to move you and your family back home if you haven't lived overseas, how to move to Northern Ireland for the first time, and even how to move your business or open up a new branch in this wonderful place that we call home. You'll also can find hundreds of interviews and profiles with fascinating people who are proud to call this place home. And you can check out all of these things and sign up for their free email newsletter at niconnections.com. Thanks very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of today's episode. You talk about lack of health and safety. I must have been 19 or 20. My first trip to Nepal and uh, we were doing post-earthquake relief stuff. And just like walking up the Himalayas and going to rural villages and being invited into people's home and, you know, eating dal and eating sheep's brain and eating all sorts of stuff. Any real standout moments for you with your time up there in particular in relation to the people? Yeah, I think 
Lots and lots of dial bat. As the saying goes, dial bat par 24 hour when you're when you're climbing up those mountains. It's why Nepalis are such good mountaineers, maybe the best in the world, all that dial bat and potatoes as well, to be fair. I think the food, you know, sitting in some of those really remote places, there's this valley near Annapurna. Lots of people go to Annapurna to do the circuit, but there's this side valley called the Narfu Valley, which is really remote and restricted. You need a special permit to go there, and it goes right up almost to the border with Tibet. And so there's very few tourists, and the communities there are not on the tourist trail, so they're, they're scratching out a fairly meager subsistence from livestock. And we might romanticize snow leopards as this beautiful animal that we see gallivanting across a screen in front of our eyes but if if your livelihood is your livestock and you feed your children from what you sell and snow leopards are eating your livestock they're an almighty pain in the neck so it was just understanding people where they're at listening to them obviously through my research assistant interpreters and understanding their you know their desires and their hopes and, and how conservation can meet people where they're at and help them solve those problems and surrounded by just this extraordinary peaks that reach to the sky and that you get a sore neck walking through the valley because there's the sky is this sliver of light with thousand meter cliffs on either side it's words fail on a landscape like that it is beyond unbelief and to have spent time there and, and done research there and worked with local partners and still be involved with, with some partnerships there has been a a dream come true and a, and a real privilege yeah man yeah so it's, it's a very very special part of the world i never would have thought that a snow leopard would have been kind of considered and thought about in the same level as a fox would be in northern ireland like ah oh, get that animal out of here do you know what i mean it's just annoying me it's really interesting yeah and it is it's very much with with large carnivores there's there's also a gap between valuing them so we value because we see them on with David Attenborough on planet Earth or something. And that's the value is is at a global level or, or culturally, but then the cost, there's always a cost and a benefit trade-off. The cost is borne by, by locals. So one of the things that I looked at with my research was could we use tourism to try and even those scales, could some of the benefits from maybe not seeing a snow leopard, but this the idea of the snow leopard is a brand for being in the Annapurna region or the other field site was the Everest region. Could we use some of that brand and some of the income from all of those tourists to go towards local herding communities through tourism? And in that case, the snow leopard transitions from being a liability to being an, an asset. And that is, it is complicated. It's, it's not just we have a magic wand. Uh, we did we've published a couple of papers. We, we talked to tourists. We talked to locals. There have been a couple of follow-on projects with an organization called the Snow Leopard Conservancy that I'm an associate of. And to bring it right up to date, I was actually there in the autumn in November because I am making a film about this story, about snow leopard conservation, about the people and the places behind the species. So if you think of a David Attenborough documentary, there's always the last 10 minutes when they do the making of. This documentary series is a whole documentary series that is, <laughs> is that 10 minutes. But for 90 minutes or three, 45 minutes, it's it's bringing to life the people and places behind the species, the, the problems that don't just fit into a, a quick Twitter post. They're, they're, they're naughty problems that require complex solutions. There are often trade-offs between... For example, having tourism, which makes the snow leopard an asset, but at the same time, tourism changes culture. It can bring roads and, and litter. So it's trying to understand that in, in all its complexity. And Yeah, and I don't think I was aware of the complexities. You know, and there's kind of, from what I can gather, as a complete outsider based on previous guests. You know, it seems like conservation as an industry is going through a lot of changes where it's becoming less and less about the Westerners parachuting into a local environment and, hey, you should be killing those rhinos. What are you guys doing to actually, as you say, working with the local communities to make those exotic animals an asset and something that actually benefits the community rather than something that, as you say, eats their, their livestock or tramples all over their fields or, you know, whatever it is. 100%. And the arc of the story is that hit the arc of history is bending towards the locals leading whereas it was the west saying to the east or to the the south 
you can't do this, don't do this, do do that, put up a big fence. Actually, a lot of these cultures and communities have been practicing their own form of conservation for centuries, maybe even millennia, certainly that predate modern Western scientific conservation. And so it's finding ways to work with the grain of that culture, but also letting locals lead. And our story is about how 40 years ago, it was Western pioneers working on the first snow leopard conservation coloring projects and things like that. A guy called Rodney Jackson off the Snow Leopard Conservancy. But it's now my good friends, Rinzin and, and Tashi, who are leading. And it's how that, that baton has been handed from Western pioneers to, to local champions. Yeah, super cool. I mean, you have a very interesting origin story. So, you know, it says you grew up between Monaghan and Malawi, which is formidable. So I'd like to talk about that. You also seem to have had like a bit of an adventurous upbringing, like you were 10 years old, you were cycling from Coleraine to Cork on a tandem bicycle, things like that. So paint a little bit of a picture of the backdrop that you, you were brought up in that then has kind of propelled you into this very exciting realm of work that uh, we're excited to find out more about. Yeah, I was born in Lisbon, of all places. But <laughs> so was I, months. come on. Really? Let's uh, get us, you know, lag and yeah, dying, so. good. The best people, but they'll have blue plaques up for us and, and give us, you know, 30 <laughs> more years. And there'll be Ulster history circles. Matt Thompson and Johnny Hansen were born here. I hope Did so. Did you go to school in Lisburg growing up? No, oh, because when born there. I was born there, and when I was nine months old, we moved to Malawi for the first time. And oh, nice. For the first I was time there. Line. Well, I, I learned to walk and talk there. My dad was very ill, and we came home unexpectedly gotcha. and went to the even more exotic location of County Monaghan. And I was in awesome. Valley Bay for nine years, from 90 to 99. And then when I was 11, we went back to Malawi, as we always, I always grew up knowing that we would someday. And I spent all of my high school years in southern Malawi running wild through the bush on the edge of the city. We, we lived in a, the biggest city in Malawi, but there was wildlife in, you know, there were snakes in my school bag, monkeys in the garden, leopards and hyena on the edge of the city that we would have been walking in their, their territory every week. Never really saw them, but uh, so I, I, to go back to the David Attenborough inspiration, which inspires many of us, I went from seeing it on the screen to experience it in real life. And at the same time, I also got to see grinding poverty and that complexity of how do you how do you have sustainable development and allow people to develop and, and realize their hopes and ambitions and have health care and education and all of these things and protect the ecosystems that sustain us all, that provide us with water and beauty and wonder and food. And it, it, I suppose it opened my eyes to the complexity of that, that perhaps you don't see in a David Attenborough documentary. And that's, it was a quick step from that then into doing what I spent my university summers, working with tigers, being attacked by emus and all sorts of things. The other thing was that my dad had done a couple of similar crazy things when he was younger. He'd, he'd cycled around the world in the 80s, him and another Northern Irish guy. He'd painted a school in Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War and he'd smuggled Bibles into Eastern Europe through the Iron Curtain. So when I announced that I was off to the Himalaya and I was off to work with tigers and lions and I mean, what could they say? What I was doing was safe the compared to what he was doing. So. <laughs> yeah, he's like, that's my boy. So I've never been more proud of you. That's interesting. <laughs> and uh, what brought your family out to Malawi in the first place? So there's quite a strong link between the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and Malawi that is post-independence, so I think from the 80s onwards. And dad, my dad and partly my mum were, were working for them. And we were part then of, we went to an international school, which was very, you know, every major world religion and some minor ones and uh, every 40 nationalities, every culture, it, it exposed me to just a really, a real diversity of people. And I came to love diversity as something to celebrate, not something to be scared of. And, and it, mm. I really like seeing Northern Ireland becoming a more diverse place. Yeah. And I mean, like, you've done lots of interesting things locally. It's not just like you've, you've done, you know, all these things around the world, very adventurous, very exciting. Talk to me about the, the farm, because I had no idea about that until recently. And I, I'd love to hear more about what 
brought you into that? Yeah, I at the same time as I grew up with this love of history and this fundamental desire deep in my inner core to work with big cats, I also developed this just love of of farming, not just the wild, but the domestic and not just nature, but agriculture. And that was in part because my grandfather was a farmer. Quite a few of my family members were farmers. And I grew up in primary school years in Monaghan in a, in a rural rural school, rural community. Most of my friends were farmers. So I became fascinated by it. I was exposed to it. And, and I realized as I started to study this issue in university that you can't solve many of the world's environmental problems without working with farmers. If you want to conserve nature, even snow leopards. Most wildlife doesn't live in national parks and game reserves. And even if it does, like in Annapurna, you have people and farming in, in those nature reserves. So outside of national parks where you need wildlife to be and flourish as well, you've got to work with farmers. You've got to understand their concerns. You've got to understand how to work with them, the, the right lever, levers and uh, incentives and, and all those sorts of things. And after I was finishing my PhD, I, I wanted to not just sit and theorize about this as I did a bit when I, in Nepal, I suppose, but I wanted to put it into practice and cr- bring all of these ideas to bear. How do you balance conservation development? How do you bring excluded groups, uh, Linarchists, adults with learning difficulties and refugees and asylum seekers and involve them in this process of looking after the world around us, whether that is growing a tomato, which is you know, tomatoes nature, we've domesticated them from wild tomatoes, or whether it's the otters in the river at Jubilee Farm. And setting that up as a, a social entrepreneur was a, a wild ride. It was the definitely the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. It was so difficult. I wow. made doing a PhD, it was like a cakewalk compared to that. <laughs> but it was also, that also the most rewarding thing. The most rewarding thing I've done professionally. It was phenomenal crazy i mean to have otters in the river is like that's like nature's seal of approval isn't it that's not a an easy feat yeah i mean we can't take the credit the others were there long before we were and they'll be there long after there is no more people in that area or whatever but to see to to, to see how you can and actually put into practice how you balance conservation and farming that they can work together is uh, it's something very topical and, and it's something we need to be doing more off i think in, in northern ireland and hopefully with a restored executive we can get back to tackling those sort of big issues sure. and so the jubilee farm entrepreneurial quest was the hardest thing you've done what did you learn through that like what are some of the lessons that you've you've carried forward with you into your your next adventures yeah a uh, couple of things one is that there can be such a thing as too much innovation all at once. Uh, I do have optimism bias. Uh, I do, and I have to take daily injections of reality to keep it in check. So not not only not only were we the first community on farm in Northern Ireland, we were the first community supported agriculture scheme. So that's like a subscription based model. It's very popular in the states and in England and the Netherlands, first of its kind here. And also the first care or social farming program to work with social with refugees and asylum seekers. So we were doing all of that innovation. That's a lot at the same time, world. not one yeah. after the other, but simultaneously. And I think looking back, it it might have been too much innovation. It was just a lot of pressure and strain. But you know, we we did it. A huge team effort. Uh, so I think now I would maybe start smaller. And, and go from there and maybe try to prioritize and order things a bit more. But at the same time, you know, you can't buy a fifth of a farm. You either have a farm or you don't have a farm. We started out <laughs> small in a, in a wall garden in Lauren. That fell through. And it was a case of do we pack up now or do we buy it, raise the money? And in a year, yeah. we went from £300 in the social enterprises account to 300000 And we purchased that farm through the generous investment of, of many people from across the world and institutions as well uh, and so when once you have that asset in place you have to innovate uh, to, to bring in the income as a social enterprise so that's one thing the, the other thing is I am really quite proud of this it's 10 years in March since I wrote that first vision statement for Jubilee Farm and the last two years since I finished 
there has been training and supporting other community farming projects across Northern Ireland. So with an organization called Cooperative Alternatives, we've run an accelerator program for 10 early stage community farming projects. And just yesterday, I was doing some training for an organization called Rural Support, who are now, tra- we were training nine social farms across Northern Ireland to work with refugees and asylum seekers. So we always said we were not the only, but the first community on farms. so that we wanted to be a catalyst for others. And now, 10 years on from that journey to see others taking on that mantle, my own passing of the baton, is uh, it's really special to see that come into fruition. It's phenomenal. So you, you've lived and worked all around the world. You spent a lot of time in and out of Northern Ireland and in and out of the island of Ireland. How is your opinion on home? How is your, I, I, your own identity kind of morphed over the years? And ultimately, why did you decide to, you know, return and, and dig your roots down here? Because you could have gone anywhere. You know, culture shock is wee buns to you, I imagine. So <laughs> you've now settled in Balmina. You're raising your family here. Why? Yeah, it's a good question. I grew up between not one, not two, but three cultures. And growing up in the Mon- in Monaghan in the late 90s, was interesting because as a, a Protestant in the Republic, we were seen as the Northerners, but also coming up here, you know, I got mild sectarian abuse for being from the South at times, and I, I really resented sectarianism for that. And then going to Malawi added a whole another degree of complexity to that. And in, in your teenage years, you, you struggle with identity. We, everybody does. So I, that's normal, but I, it was compounded in my case by this question of who am I? And we weren't just in Malawi for set nine, eight, nine years. We were back every summer to Monaghan and to family in Ahadui and near the North Coast. So I was there was just this churn within me of, of who am I? Am I Irish? Am I British? Am I Malawi? And I, I kind of seesawed between those. And in the end, I actually was mad into rugby at the time and I was going to come home to do sixth form here and, and just play rugby. And I had, you know, Ulster, Ireland, British and Irish Lions all planned out and something just changed to me then I decided to stay in Malawi for sixth form and in my sixth form years I think I decided that I didn't have to choose any of those identities but I chose all of them and that made me an Afro-Anglo-Irish man and I'm still an afro anglo <laughs> and I always will be and Put that on it, your leg then. <laughs> it, well it, I've built my life on that my life is enriched by the legacy of not one, not two, but three great countries. And I live in Northern Ireland. My wife is Northern Irish. My kids are Northern Irish. A part of me is Northern Irish, but a part of me will always be in Monaghan and and always be in Malawi as well. So I feel very fortunate to have had that diversity of of experience. And I'm also grateful to to put down roots here in Northern Ireland as well. And what is it about home? that push you guys over the edge to be like, yeah, yeah, actually, this is where we're going to, this is where we're going to be. I think home is where the heart is and my heart is my family. So if wherever they are, that, you know, home is people to me rather than a particular place. I could make my home anywhere. And, and there is, I, I do like to travel and have been fortunate even the last year, I'm writing this book on whether or not we should reintroduce wolves and lynx and bears to these islands i'm, I'm neutral on the issue because it's, it's quite a complex topic but i've traveled across switzerland and the netherlands and then i did a massive road trip across the usa really getting to grips with this topic and seeing what it looks like getting under the skin of it uh, and i love leaving northern ireland and going traveling to places like that but i, I love coming home as well and living in malawi i love coming home every year and and the the 40 shades of green you just when you live somewhere dry and arid and malawi is dry and arid much of the year outside of the rainy season and you come back to the 40 shades of green it is beautiful beyond words class man tell us about what's next for you you've got lots of exciting things coming up even in the next few months and so you know please plug and promote and celebrate everything that you're doing because we'd love to find out more sure so my 
TEDx talk, which was done at Queen's. There was a TEDx QUB just on the 6th of December. And I did a talk at that called Coexisting with Carnivores, the reintroduction debate. And if you're interested in my book on the topic, which is out February 2025, this is a 10 minute teaser of what the book <laughs> is going to be it's looking at. And I'm hoping trailer. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much it, with me also wearing some hats, five different hats. So if you're interested in that, it's 10 minutes introduction to this topic, which is, is pretty complex, but also fascinating that some of us, we absolutely love this idea of bringing links and wills back and others can't think of anything worse and say, well, we got rid of these animals for a reason. So because I have, am a snow leopard conservationist and have kept livestock and farmed them, I speak fluent farmer, I speak fluent conservationist. This is my attempt to to translate between those two camps, but also for the average person that this is what this topic entails. These are the the, the yeah. challenges and the risks. So hopefully we can I get that in the show added, notes. I, I just added it there now to the show notes. So if you're listening Brilliant. or watching, please just click that whenever you want to take a look at it. Super. That That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Watch and share widely. The other thing on that theme and asking in relation to this topic, can we learn from the poll? Because we were talking about how conservation is often the West telling the East what to do. Well, can we learn from places like Nepal about living with these animals? And that short Northern Ireland screen funded taste your tape is premiering at the Northern Ireland Science Festival on the 24th of February at the Ulster Museum. The link to get tickets should be in the show notes as well. Uh, and I just added it there now. <laughs> happy days, you're on fire. It's going to be, it, just to manage expectations, it's a really short, it's a prototype, really, if we will use this story to hopefully get more funding and make something longer. But it's a, it's a short whirlwind through our adventures in Nepal back in November. My two Nepali colleagues, the, the stars of the show, I'm just there as a supporting supporting role. And But I'll also be joined by some guests, Nisha Tandon from Artsecta and also Mark Emerson from Queen's to ask, what does this story mean for Northern Ireland today? Mm. And also because I do live shows, which are not death by PowerPoint, there will be some stunts, some audience participation. It's suitable for late primary school upwards. So it's an event that all the family can come to. So get your tickets before they disappear. Love it, mate. Love it. Final question. It's not usually where we end, but I, I think it would be fun to end here, uh, given what we've talked about today. If you could take anyone from Northern Ireland out for a pint or a coffee or a glass of wine or whatever it is you like to drink who would you take where would you take them why what would you talk about so i would i would take st patrick uh i'm not sure st patrick was a drinking man it probably was but but who knows i would have <laughs> taken him with to slemish which is just outside my, my current home of Balamina, and where he obviously spent a bit of time history and, and legend alike tell us and I'd be interested in talking to him about a couple of things. I mean, it, it, it's interesting in this very febrile environment of, of immigration that if you think of the four patron saints of the four parts of Britain and Ireland, St. George was not English, St. Andrew was not Scottish, and St. Patrick was not Irish. Only St. David was Welsh. He was a, St. Patrick was from what is now Wales. He was a Roman citizen at the, the end of the Roman Empire in Britain. So... I'd be interested in his take on this complex ethno-religious nationalism that has dominated our politics for so long. What, what he thinks of it, because he was he, he is an, an icon of Ireland, grew up in an environment that's very diverse and all these different ethnic groups. And I'd be interested in his take on the Northern Irish Assembly and Stormont and the state we're in at the moment. The other thing is back in the fifth century we still had wolves running around and, and he was obviously a farmer on Slemish for a while so I'd be interested on getting a snapshot of his thoughts on how he managed that how what was running around whether links there's a big question mark about with whether we've ever had links not the deodorant but the, the medium-sized cat with tufty ears whether we've had those in Ireland or whether we haven't there's a there's a big debate so I'd be interested in asking him did you see any when you were Hurting those pigs in Slammer. Uh, I think it'd be a really interesting guy to talk to. And do you think he drove snakes out of Ireland? Like any insight into that? Yeah, I'm not too sure. But in terms of a, a story to finish with, let me finish with my snake story, which is even better than the St. Patrick one. I, <laughs> okay, I just arrived in Malawi. <laughs> yeah, just arrived in Malawi. I let me second week at school. So this was September 1999. I was 11. And I 
got we were staying in rented accommodation our house wasn't ready i got my black satchel out to put my lunch in one morning before going to school and i saw this thing in my bag and as three thoughts went through my head in very quick succession one that's my brother's rubber snake two my brother's rubber snake is not black and three that rubber snake's moving and i said to my mother there's a snake in my school bag and she said i right i said no trust me there's a snake in my school bag you put and, too much toy story there's a snake in my yeah food. all right all right <laughs> too too much deadly sexy or whatever it was back in those days so i just closed the satchel very gently and i lifted it and i took it outside and i put the bag on its side give it a tap with my foot and this fairly substantial black snake came shooting out of it and ran for its life never saw it again but what that means is this was in our house either the snake came into the house during the night and crawled into my sleep into the satchel or the satchel had been sitting in the sun at school when we were doing sport the previous afternoon the other possibility is it crawled into that the bag then and i carried it home either way it was uh it was a wild experience that that said, "This is Africa. You're not in Monaghan anymore." <laughs> well, there you go. There's a there, there's a big advert for uh, for living in Northern Ireland. At the end of that, if you don't want your <laughs> kids to have snakes in their backpacks, live in Balmain. <laughs> Absolutely. The the wildlife. The, there's no wildlife you need to be worried about. Maybe it's just the people you have to watch out for. But they're they're okay too. They're okay. <laughs> uh, Johnny, man, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Amazing stuff. Just want to give one final thanks to NI Connections for making today's episode possible. You can sign up for their free email newsletter at niconnections.com where you'll get straight to your inbox interesting stories from people who are from this place but are living and working overseas. You'll also get some really interesting insider information about best practices of how to move back home or how to start a business here and all this other really, really interesting stuff. niconnections.com is the place to do that. And we're so, so grateful that we're able to keep this series going thanks to NI Connection support. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for checking out the podcast. Cheers.